Hello and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church's Sermon Podcast for Sunday, September 16th, 2018. This morning, Rev. Dr. Paul Cunningham is starting a new fall sermon series on engagement. The nine-week series is titled, Engage Like Jesus. This week, we're looking at the third chapter of the Gospel of John, the story of Nicodemus, and Jesus telling him he must be born again. Today's sermon is titled, What's the Point? We're looking at the scripture of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Please listen after the sermon for a few announcements. You can also learn about what's happening at La Jolla Press by visiting our website, ljpress.org, downloading the La Jolla Press app on your smartphone or tablet, or by contacting the church office at 858-454-0713. And now here's Paul with What's the Point? So this morning, we are beginning a new sermon series that will carry us um, into the middle of November, talking about the theme of engagement and considering uh, the life of Jesus and how he engaged those around him. So of course, thinking about the idea of engagement, it took me back 25 years ago to when my wife and I got engaged. Um, We actually had kind of this strange thing. We had to actually pick a date to get engaged. This was the kind of the craziness, so much for the romantic sort of thing, right? Like surprise and all that. But we were just living these crazy lives, and I was in New Jersey going to seminary, and she was living in California, and we were trying to figure out how to, you know, get up to summer camp and get started with the summer jobs that we had. So, um, so, so that added a little pressure to me in terms of how it was that we were going to get engaged. And so I had kind of come up with this creative um, idea of, of kind of going back and, and, you know, kind of reminiscing about some of the certain places that we had been and moments that had had uh, significant to it, significance to us. And we were going to go up to near the camp where we met. And I was going to kind of go off to this place where there's this beautiful, one, wonderful waterfall and, you know, surprise her and all that sort of stuff. So the plan was going along great and wonderful. And we're driving along and we've hit every spot and we've, you know, we've taken pictures. You remember those things that weren't on phones? I mean, this was back in the day. You had no idea if you took a good picture or not until you got it. And you're like, oh man, that's a terrible picture. And y'all probably never experienced any of that. So uh, anyway, so we've done that, and we've taken the pictures, and I had this whole moment plan, and we start driving to the place where I want to go, and we keep driving and driving and driving, and my wife's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I've just got something planned, and we keep, and we're kind of meandering through, and she looks at me, and she says, are you lost? <laughs> Seriously. This is our engagement, and you are lost. I'm like, I got it. I don't know what you're worried about. I'm totally directionally non-challenged. See, I learned something a long, long, long time ago that perhaps I am directionally challenged. So we kept driving and meandering and meandering. And finally I said, okay, I have no idea where we are. I am completely lost. She's like, I just, she's like, and she's had this conversation with me now for 25 years, basically. Like, how in the world can you just not figure out where you're going? And I said, so this was back in the days of maps, Remember, not, not maps on your phone, but maps, like paper maps. You all remember those sorts of things? And remember the L.A. one? Like, if you, did you ever live in Los Angeles and you had, like, the massive, was it Thomas and Cook or whatever it was? I mean, just crazy. You had to have three or four maps to get around, books to get around. Anyway, um, so I said, go ahead, open the glove box. There's a map in there, and we'll try and figure out where we're going. So my wife opens up the glove box, opens up the map, and guess what's in the middle of the map? An engagement ring pinned right to the spot that we're going to go to to get engaged because honestly, I was not lost. I knew exactly where we were. And when she opened that up and she saw the engagement ring, I have to tell you something honestly though. I aimed too high on the engagement because do you know what happens when you start your marriage like that? (laughs) And my wife will attest to this. It's like the expert, I mean, I always tell guys, and I'm like, put the bar down low, all right? (laughs) Because when you raise the bar up that high and you completely surprise your wife, even on a day she knew she was going to get engaged and all that sort of stuff, you have just raised the bar way too high for the next 25 plus years. So just a little heads up if you're thinking about getting engaged. But anyway, wonderful. My wife has stayed with me for those 25 years, which is pretty darn wonderful and amazing. But it's interesting, this theme of engagement. Jesus actually, in the New Testament, 
as he speaks, when he talks about what he's all about, he actually uses language of engagement, language of around the theme of marriage. Because when we get engaged, we are saying something. We're, we're, we're getting ready to make the next step. We're saying we want to be together. Oh, and so when Jesus comes and he begins to engage the world and his disciples, he uses language that's related to marriage. So follow this. At the Last Supper, as he gathers the disciples, and he says, take this cup. This cup is a covenant I'm making with you. Drink of it. That's engagement language. Because in the days of Jesus, when a man wanted to get engaged, he would go to his bride's house-to-be, and he would pour a glass of wine, and he would say, take this cup. I'm making a covenant with you. I want to spend my life with you. Drink it. It's engagement. John chapter 14, a text we know fairly well. Jesus is talking to a bunch of confused disciples, and he says, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you so that you might be with me. This is engagement language. This is marriage language. Because after the young man had gone to the woman's house and said, this is the cup, I want you to drink of it. If she drank of it, guess what he did? He went back to his father's house. And he built on an additional room. So that when they were married, they might have a place to stay. So Jesus uses this language of marriage of covenant, of preparing a place. And then in Matthew 25, Jesus tells this, this parable about the ten virgins who are waiting for the groom to arrive, and some of them light their lamps, and some of them don't have enough oil for their lamps, and all this sort of stuff. And he's talking about this idea of saying, be ready for the groom when he arrives. You don't know when he's going to arrive, but be ready. And as he tells that parable, he's talking about the return of Christ. He's talking about himself. He's saying, because one day the groom will return for his church. One day Christ will return. And we don't always pick up on all of that as we kind of just read and breeze through the New Testament. But Jesus is using marriage language. He's using covenant language. And what we want to talk about this fall is how and why and what Jesus engaged why did Jesus come in the first place? So we're going to look at the first couple of weeks. How did Jesus engage? What does it mean that Jesus was filled with grace and truth? And what does that say to us? In the following weeks, we're going to talk about what were the things that he engaged in? What were the conversations that he had? What can we glean about how we need to engage the world. Because our engagement is helping others take one step closer, hopefully, to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning we begin that journey. We're in John chapter 3. If you'd like to follow along, we're going to read the first 21 verses. Uh, it is the story of Nicodemus. And if you'd pray with me first, that would be wonderful. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to worship, to sing, to listen, to lift our voices up, and now, Lord, to allow your spirit to minister to us. Would you guide us and lead us in these moments that we have together? May Jesus Christ be exalted and lifted up. And God, may we go deeper in our understanding of who you are, and the plans you have for our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, which we would call the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you. So this is one of the amen statements of Jesus. Whenever you read uh, through the Gospel of John, um, there are a number of times where Jesus will say, amen, amen, um, which means he's saying something that we really need to pay attention to. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Nicodemus asked this question because he himself is old, okay? Um, And I'll explain that in just a second. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And if you notice something about the words of Nicodemus, they get shorter and shorter and shorter. Now he gets four words. How can this be? And then he's done talking. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, verse 10. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. And I love this. This is, what we're, this is why Christ came. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not de- believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Why did Jesus come? Why did he engage? Why does he have these conversations? Because he came to bring God's salvation. So this guy named Nicodemus shows up. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He is a leading religious leader. He is a part of the Sanhedrin. He is the best of the best. We've talked about this before. Guys like Simon Peter, guys like James and John, guys like Andrew. Those guys were not the best of the best. How do we know that? Because they were fishermen. If you were the best of the best, if you were born into the right family, if you were smart, if you had wisdom, if you had the right connections, you became a religious leader, you became a Pharisee. And then if you were really wise and really smart and really well connected, not only were you a religious leader and a Pharisee, you became a part of the Sanhedrin because that was the elite. That was the Supreme Court of Israel, if you were at will. The 70 guys, and they were all guys, and they were all old. But if you became a part of that, you had arrived. There was nothing better. Nothing else you could put on your resume that would top any of that, unless if you were the chief priest of the Sanhedrin. That's the only thing. So Nicodemus rolls in to see Jesus at night. And it's interesting how he addresses him. Did y'all catch that? He calls him Rabbi, his fellow Sanhedrin members would have been aghast at him calling Jesus rabbi. Because to be a rabbi, you had to be a teacher. To be a rabbi, you had to have gone to Torah school. You had to have gone to seminary. You had to have been educated to be a rabbi. To be a teacher like that, you had to, you had to have accomplished something. And Jesus was a carpenter. He was not the best of the best. But Nicodemus said, 
We know that you have to be from God, though. Because no one could do the things that you are doing if God wasn't with you. And that's the big crux for Nicodemus. Is, if you notice, in, in that first encounter he has with Jesus, he doesn't really even a- ask a question. And Jesus then rolls back and says, look, if you want to understand this, you have to be born again. Or technically, you could also say, you have to be born from above. And Nicodemus, this old dude standing in front of Jesus, hears Jesus say this language that you've got to be born again. And he looks at himself and he says, that's impossible. How can I be born again? And understand this, something that's very important for Nicodemus, because this is going against the grain of everything that he has been taught. Because what mattered to Nicodemus and what mattered to the people of Israel was that you were born into the family of Abraham. Your family mattered. And now Jesus rolls out and says, you know what? Your family doesn't matter. What matters is that you're born from above. Not who your mother is and not who your father is. And if you were watching this conversation at this moment, I guarantee you Nicodemus is backpedaling. Because this is not what he wants to hear. He's a religious leader. He's a great teacher. He knows his Bible back and forth. And, he, and he's like, how in the world can you be born again? Now, the good thing to know is that that word born again has been causing trouble, trouble for people for 2,000 years. I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but I remember you know, early on in my faith, and I was talking to someone about my faith or whatever it was, and they asked me this question. Well, have you been born again? And I'm like, I'm just a Presbyterian from Fresno, California. What do you mean have I been born? I mean, I was kind of like Nicodemus, right? I'm like, I just follow Jesus. But that trouble, that question sometimes trips us up. Of, well, what does it mean to be born again? I don't have time. I'm not going to even get into that this morning. So we're going to just let that lie. But I'm just saying that sometimes that causes concerns for folks. It caused concerns for Nicodemus. So Jesus then says, okay, let me go a little deeper. It's not just about being born again. It's about being born of, of, of water and the Spirit. And, and now he's kind of talking some Old Testament language that perhaps Nicodemus would recognize. That You look, you look in the book of Ezekiel, and, and in Ezekiel 36, um, God talks about sprinkling the people with water and cleansing them. Genesis chapter 2, God talks about breathing his breath into Adam and giving him life. Ezekiel 37, it's the valley of dry bones and God brings his spirit, right, and and enlivens those dry bones. And he says, look, this is how it happens. You're born from above. You're purified by God's grace and God's mercy. The spirit of God fills your life. I guarantee you Nicodemus is looking at Jesus like, I have no idea what you're saying. It's kind of like that blind, you know, if you, well, those of you who have teenagers, right? You know that look on their face they get when you're trying to have a real conversation with them? And it's like they're not rolling their eyes because they know they'd get in trouble if they rolled their eyes. But it's that blank stare of just like, uh. <laughs> My kids are never like that, by the way. So I don't, you know, I, I haven't seen it in a long time. Only in other people's kids do I ever see this. So. Um, but you all know what I'm saying. I mean, it's just like this. And that's kind of how Nicodemus just has to be eyes glazed over like, gosh, I have to be born from above and not from Abraham. That doesn't make sense. And I have to be born of water and the spirit. And how the heck does that happen? And that's what he asks. This man who is the best of the best. This man who could go to any temple and have temple privileges and teach anybody who is there. says to Jesus, ask Jesus, how can this be? Because you know what he's got stacked up on his side? He's got all the diplomas. He's got all the accolades. He's got all the right initials after his name. He's got his MDiv, his DMIN, his PhD, his blah, 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 everything else you can possibly imagine. And Jesus is telling him, that's not what matters. He says, what matters is you have to be born again. You have to be born from above. And Nicodemus says, 
How can this be? And Jesus, I I like to imagine it goes this way. I don't know if it really went this way or not. He says, Nicodemus, let's go back to the law. Let's go back. Let's see, what, what, what book should we go back to? Jesus thinking to himself. He's like, hmm, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Nicodemus, I want you to think about Numbers chapter 21. You all know Numbers chapter 21, right? You guys will be doing fine on this test that Jesus is. I don't expect you to know it. This is the good news right here in this whole thing. Trust me, because Jesus is making this point. But he's saying, Jesus would never ask the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, the next chapter that we have, where Jesus encounters the sinful woman at at the well. He would never say to her, tell me about Numbers 21. That's just not the way he's going to roll. But with Nicodemus, who is an expert in the law, Jesus says, do you remember Numbers 21? Now, I know since most of you don't remember Numbers chapter 21, we're just going to look at it for ourselves, okay? Verses 8 and 9. Let me set the context. Surprise, surprise, Israel has been grumbling and complaining in the wilderness. Shocking. I know know you just cannot believe that that ever happened to Moses or any other leader ever had to deal with a group of people who were whining and complaining as they walked through the wilderness. But we know that Moses absolutely had to do with that. So God gets frustrated, and God sends snakes. Remember Harrison Ford, like in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? I hate snakes. It's that kind of snakes, right? So these snakes are biting people and they're dying. Because God's like, I'm sick and tired of you guys. So Moses intercedes as Moses did for the people. Thank goodness for Moses. And this is what verse 8 and 9 of Numbers 21 say. And this is why Jesus asked Nicodemus about it. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was lifted up by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Now, poor Nicodemus has to be looking at this like pre-cross. Like he, you guys get that you're like, oh, lift it up. Jesus is lifted up. We, we get that. But man, Nicodemus, he's just done. I mean, I can guarantee you he is just like, I have no idea anymore, Jesus, what you're talking about. Being lifted up. And, but, but the context was this. There were venomous, poisonous snakes on the ground that were literally destroying the people who were walking on the ground. Their only salvation was that if something was raised up, that would take the venom away, that would take the poison away. And what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is watch and wait. Because one day, I will be lifted up. And one day, I will take the poison, and I will take the venom, and I will take the loss, and I will die so that you might live. You see, Nicodemus came to Jesus wanting information. He wanted a few more rules to live by. It's not as though the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders didn't have enough rules already. But what Nicodemus wanted was a reformation of his life. He wanted some reforms. He wanted certain things he could do or not do to make sure that he was earning God's favor. Because remember, this is where the faith of Nicodemus comes in complete... um, What am I trying to say? (laughs) Wonderful. I'm just making sure you all are with me. Collides. Okay, how about that? There's a word. This is where the faith of Nicodemus collides with the grace of Jesus. Because Nicodemus is asking for information and reformation. Lord, what do I have to do? What program can I get in? How can I do this? How can I do that? What law do I need to follow? What's the new teaching? Jesus wasn't about information and reformation. He was about transformation. And this was something completely new for Nicodemus. Because what Jesus is driving out with Nicodemus is he's saying, 
The Spirit of God has to work from inside of you. The cleansing has to happen from the inside. It's the power of God that will literally transform your life. Do you want that? And this, my friends, is the challenge to us. Because it's not just about acquiring more knowledge. It's not just about getting the right kind of information or following the right kind of laws. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. Why did he come? He came to bring salvation for the one thing we could not do on our own. And you have Nicodemus, who is the primary example of the put-together person who has accomplished everything they would ever want to accomplish, who is faithful in going to church, who is faithful in going to Bible study, who is faithful in showing up for everything that you ever had to possibly show up for, who just wanted to know a little bit more, Jesus, what else do I have to do? And Jesus says, I don't care. What Jesus was really saying is saying, it says, your heart been transformed by my love. Are you just checking off boxes? And for those of us who live in this Western world of ours that loves to check off boxes, these words should make us kind of awaken And think through, have I really allowed the transforming power of Jesus Christ to take root in my life? Have I given myself to him? Or do I just do the faith thing out of duty and obedience? Because what Jesus wants with us is a living, personal relationship. Jesus said it. I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. Then why is it that the church is better known for everything that we are against than what we are for? And I always have to keep that question in front of myself. You go out in this community and you ask people about the church, they can tell you everything that we are against, whether that's true or not true. But they have an opinion about that. And Jesus says, I came to give you life. And we're going to talk about that balance in a couple of weeks. So I, I, I'm not going to spend any more time on that this morning. Here's where I want to end. We've made this journey before with Nicodemus, and you may or, or may not remember it. But Nicodemus shows up two other times in the Gospel of John. It's interesting because we don't always get those stories of someone who kind of comes to Jesus and then kind of see where they end up and, and what happens to their lives. The second time is at the end of the Gospel Uh, at the end of of John chapter 7. The Jewish leaders are trying to go after Jesus. There's a crowd that's upset, and there's a crowd that's for him, and the Jewish leaders are saying, we're just going to take him out. Like, this is ridiculous. And in John chapter 7, verse 50, we read this. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, so remember, this is the religious leaders, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him, to find out what he has been doing. (laughs) They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Just another knucklehead from Galilee, right? But why is Nicodemus doing this? Because something's happening in his heart. Something's changed in him. And to do what he did, I mean, that was, like, that was craziness. But Nicodemus sticks up for Jesus because 
the transformation is happening. And then we get to the end of the Gospel of John. After the death of Jesus, John chapter 19, verses 39 and 40. 39 and 40. So this now tells the story of Joseph of Arimathea as he connects with Nicodemus. It says, now Joseph of Arimathea was, connect, was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. So after the crucifixion of Jesus. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Who's there at the very end? Nicodemus. This one who had gone to Jesus earlier and said, what do I need to do? And Jesus had said, let the Spirit of God take over your life. And at the very end, Nicodemus shows up to wrap the body of the one who had been lifted up, the one who had taken the poison, the one who had absorbed the death. And together with Joseph of Arimathea, they wrap the body of Jesus and place him in the tomb. Because Nicodemus had a whole new understanding now of what it meant to follow in God's way. Because Christ had engaged him in word and then Nicodemus understood what Numbers 21 was all about. His life was changed forever. Not because of what he had accomplished, but because of the Savior he had received. Jesus said, I came that people might have salvation. that their lives might be transformed. And that's my prayer for us. That's why we start there. That we might allow Jesus to take up space in our lives. That we might be transformed like a pharisaical religious leader who understood finally what God's grace was all about. Let's pray. God, some of us sitting in this room this morning may have just been checking the box. Lord, it's easy to check the box. But Lord, actually, I think it's easier to ask you to take up residence in our lives. So, Lord, if some of us have been acting like Nicodemus, looking on the outside as though everything is all together, and yet, Lord, we've never really trusted our lives to you. We've never really let you transform our lives. Lord, if that's the case, then help us to do that. Help us to trust and to know the transformation that is possible. Lord, the Apostle Paul says that we are a new creation. And that's what Nicodemus was on his way to becoming. Lord, help us to receive that good news, to be born of water in the Spirit, and to know the transformation that is possible that we might know your joy 
and your delight. We pray and ask in our Savior's name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for listening. Here's some of what's happening here at La Jolla Press. This is the last week to register for the Women's Retreat. The getaway will be October 12th through the 14th at the wonderful Konakai Resort and Spa. The theme is Prayer, a Pathway to God. You can register online at ljpress.events. This fall, we will be offering Divorce Care class on Wednesdays, now through December 12th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in room LC1. Divorce Care, led by life coach and divorce recovery mentor India Kern, is a support group designed to offer help and guidance one needs while going through the transition of divorce or separation. The cost is $40, which includes materials. RSVP to India Kern at me, M-E, at indiakern.com. Also this fall, we will host a grief share class on Thursdays from September 20th through December 20th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. in room LC5. Reverend Scott Mitchell will be leading grief share to help those struggling with the recent loss of a loved one. The cost is $25 for materials. RSVP to Scott at 858-729-5595 or scottm at ljpress.org. This fall, there are lots of classes, groups, and fellowship opportunities starting off. The best way to get plugged in is to go to the website, ljpress.org, and look for the orange fall leaves button that says, starting in the fall. There's something there for everyone. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around La Jolla Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's ljpres.org, or call the church office at 858 858- Four five four zero seven one three. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings, and we hope to see you soon.